hello and welcome everyone. Today is Thursday, October 20th. Uh, welcome to our Thursday community call. Uh, today we're gonna be chatting about uh, some SCURF vision uh, and what is some of the potential future of SCURF. Uh, this is kind of uh, presenting, um, yeah, just presenting some ideas, a single uh, vision. This is not meant to be any kind of definitive statement of this is uh, the fully kind of community agreed upon and organizationally agreed upon uh, vision. This is much more of my own personal view uh, and a conversation starter to get more feedback uh, from within our community and anyone who's interested externally and in kind of joining our community and giving us some feedback as we think how we can best accomplish our mission and what, how do we get there, uh, especially recognizing that we're at this point in growth of SCURF itself, where we're transitioning from a single funder environment where we just had Chainlink as our founding funder and uh, give us this very extensive uh, kind of runway and opportunity to start building. Uh, and now it looks like we're, we're close to securing our second funder uh, and uh, having a variety of other conversations. So this feels like an appropriate time to kind of revisit some of this. Um, before we delve into that, I do have a short presentation that I just kind of want to talk through two user studies and then open up or two potential future user journeys. Um, but before getting there, I want to I want to touch on uh, any housekeeping just so folks can mention any other uh, guild meetings or anything else that's going on at SCURF uh, this weekend and next week that people want to plug. So are there any other uh, kinds of meetings or anything else that the community should know about? Uh, so we do have, I mean, so maybe of less interest to the people in this particular meeting, uh, but for the good of the order, uh, we are having a second onboarding boot camp uh, this month. So uh, in the past, we've had just one at the beginning of the month, uh, and this month we are doing two. So we have some more friendly time zones. Uh, so uh, on Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, there will be another uh, onboarding boot camp. Uh, as uh, has always been the case, uh, even those who have gone through our onboarding process before and know SCURF pretty well, uh, you are also invited to come and meet some of the newer people joining our community. So uh, expect to see some announcements of, on the onboarding call. Uh, and then I also just want to plug how um, great some of the comments coming from the writing cohort have been. Uh, so if you have not been on the forum uh, yet this week, uh, there is a, a new flood of comments as uh, the members of the cohort have been uh, producing. So please go to the forum, engage with that, like stuff, and then of course, don't forget, if you really particularly like something, uh, to nominate it for comment of the month. Uh, you should see in the top of the forum banner, uh, there is a big yellow box uh, that takes you right to the current thread where you can make those nominations. Um, so grab a link, take it over to that thread, and make a nomination if you think something is awesome. Great, thank you, Paul. Does anyone have any other uh, any other meetings or any other activities that they wanna make sure to plug with the community? Well, we've got the first week of November um, is going to be the Community Chat Guild, which is at 1 p.m. Pacific time. And then the second Friday of every month is the Source Cred Guild, which is at also at 1 p.m. Pacific time. So those are the two coming up. And then are we doing Coffee House also today at 10 a.m. right after this? Is that still on? That is a good question. I actually need to double check on that. Let me quickly message John and I will follow up with an update. Um, yeah, by the end of the call. Um, the only other thing I was going to mention was that we had a very small update, but a nice update to Scurf.io. We added a newsletter sign up form that takes you into Substack. So that's uh, a new addition. And the banner was updated as well on the forum. As you may have noticed, we made it more responsive. And when you navigate to other pages, the banner will collapse itself down to be more minimal. And we're also going to be adding a way to show notifications there so, with, so that people who, who are viewing the forum can get some more timely information. So that's about it for me today. Cool, thank you. And then uh, Yvonne, are we, does it, 
look like we will be publishing the trailer for season two of the podcast uh, this week, or is that going to be next week? So it might actually happen today. It just it kind of pertains on the the answer we get from Renee. Um, so the plan still is to get that up and running uh, in the following hours. Cool. Yeah. So keep an eye out uh, for uh, the Scurf SCRF interviews podcast or our YouTube channel. Uh, and the first episode of that mini series is going to be a live episode recorded, just audio only. But that one's going to be recorded uh, live in Bogota, where Renee Davis, who's a scurf contributor uh, and founder at Talent Dow, uh, where she uh, spoke to John, who's one of the core contributors at Safe Dow, uh, which is the Dow forming around Gnosis Safe, uh, as they've kind of uh, rebranded as Safe. Um, but yeah, all right, great. So, uh, does anyone have any other? Announcements or anything they want to plug. Cool. So with that, I will go ahead and just jump into a brief presentation that I put together. Uh, oh yes, Lisa, please. Yeah, Lisa, please feel free to hop in. Hey, Lisa, I see you have your virtual hand raised. So if you did, uh, if that was intentional, please hop off mute. We can't hear you yet. Uh, and please feel free to speak. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and get started and feel free to just cut me off as soon as you, you uh, get your audio working. Uh, but yeah, otherwise, uh, please do feel free to either raise hand or drop questions in comment. I'll be keeping an eye on chat as, uh, as I'm running through this. But this is a, yeah, more meant to be as a uh, conversation starter than a proper, uh, proper, proper presentation. It's still kind of in working draft form, so excuse any work in progress elements of it. But yeah, kind of slowly starting to think through a scurf vision and clearly articulate it and uh, co-define it with the community. So a uh, good starting point uh, to think about the vision is, well, what's our mission in the first place, right? So scurf's uh, mission uh, since the get-go has been focused around bringing together uh, researchers uh, and builders, you know, academics and those in industry, however you want to uh, break down that dichotomy. But those who are more kind of theoretically thinking ideas and those who are actually implementing them in the world to create more groundbreaking uh, advancements in the Web3 space. And we think the point of actionable research and how do you not just highlight research? How do you not just have really great discussions around research? But how do you have a collection of these interrelated activities that all together could hopefully create more of an action for bias, uh, excuse me, a bias for action around research. Uh, and so the vision, and this is again, very much a personal vision. This is not meant to be uh, institutional at this point in time. Just when, when I think of the components that I'm gonna walk you through in the, in the sub subsequent couple of slides, this is what comes to mind in my mind. It's a, what is creating the environment for sort of a, for a decentralized agora or open uh, space for quality discourse and discussion combined with elements of a decentralized Bell Labs or a really innovative environment where there's just this sort of, um, yeah, just a high potential stickiness of ideas arising, getting to the right people and these kind of environments that seem to really facilitate that kind of a bias for action around ideas and not just generating ideas. And Bell Labs is a stand-in. It's by no means meant to be specific in, by any means there. Um, and so what are the different components then uh, for SCURF as part of that, right? There's the curation component, facilitation, and I'm sorry, curation, just to say curation and discussion. There's the curation and discussion component, facilitation, uh, there are the outputs that we generate, there are the networks that we build, uh, and there's more primary research components as a potential future uh, addition. And so the curation and discussion components, so these have been sort of right the, the cornerstone of where we started to a, a, to a large degree, right? The, the forum, thinking of the different posts we can get on there, having elements such as uh, the research pulse, which can uh, really provide additional levels of curation in case you haven't come across it. Uh, definitely check out the Research Pulse newsletter. It's a great weekly uh, curated list where, um, excuse me, someone works through three to 500 uh, papers on a weekly basis and curate sort of five to 10 or so 
to, to show what are some of the more interesting research pieces uh, that are becoming publicly available in a given week. Um, and thinking about, right, all of that is the, the actual content hitting the forum or that we're putting out there. And then how do we actually maximize the discourse with it, right? How do we create a, a moderated high quality environment where we can have the kind of discussions that, uh, you know, new ideas can be inspired from, that can serve as a point of potential feedback, that can provide value, that can be great learning opportunities, that can provide value in many different forms. Uh, and we recently trialed a, a writing cohort, as Paul mentioned, we're growing through our first one, uh, and very likely that we will uh, be pursuing more of these in the future. So uh, if you if you missed the chance to, to sign up for this one and you are interested in future ones, please feel free to let Paul or myself know. We'll definitely keep you posted on any future announcements, though. We'll obviously announce those in the community as well. Um, you know, we trialed a version of the mentorship program before, and we want to bring that back or maybe think of a more specific skill-based acquisition pathways as opposed to a larger mentorship program that is meant to, to have a, a really large outcome at the end, more compartmentalize it into very specific skill acquisition, and how can we supplement that with, you know, writing cohorts or the forum or other versions of engagement or pathways into SCURF. Um, I talked about some of the curation in terms of things like Research Pulse, but also in terms of, right, some of the conversations that we have here, uh, the, the weekly office, the, uh, not the office hours, excuse me, the, the coffee house chat that we've been hosting for, for a bit over a month or so, uh, and these kinds of other uh, versions of kind of curating certain topics and finding ways to actually discuss them. And in the future, this kind of naturally feels, at least for me, to evolve into, right, if we really reinforce this environment where there's quality research coming in, there's high quality engagement and discussion and writing around that research, it kind of feels natural to get to the point of providing direct feedback on research or maybe even giving something that's more akin to formal peer review uh, or more open decentralized versions of that, even if it's not as part of a specific journal's releasing of a specific issue. Um, and so, right, how can we actually uh, slowly start thinking about uh, what elements of a review or feedback are really a positive constructive criticism that we could generate here on the forum and provide as a value add in this broad bucket of curation and discussion. Uh, and this last bullet point is more to say, like, if we're already doing this, we, we really got to be aware of who's, you know, publishing the, the research, especially any new venues that are publishing the research. Uh, you know, maybe we will, maybe we won't explore collaborating or maybe even launching any kind of journals in the future, uh, but those are very much future discussions. And um, yeah, uh, I, yeah, we can come back to those if and when uh, appropriate for us to discuss. Um, or when it just feels like a better time, especially given all the other stuff going on at the moment. Um, then in terms of facilitation, uh, so this, right, we've already been focusing on research knowledge facilitation via discussion, via certain types of uh, actual interaction types that we facilitated, like the Web3 workshop or some of our live events that we've run or other virtual uh, events and convenings that we've run where we actually uh, had someone come to us, a researcher, and say, hey, I would really love to get to uh, just have a, you know, off the record discussion with a few DAO contributors on what does offboarding in DAOs really look like? And I know if it's a recorded public conversation, they're going to sugarcoat it a little bit. And can you help us create a small conversation like that? And so that is something that, you know, we can potentially provide uh, a, a way that we can provide value to researchers is finding ways to help them run those kinds of points of facilitation or different kinds of workshops to make sure they can advance their actual work and keep it as impactful and as relevant as possible so that we can, you know, focus on facilitating that knowledge to the people who need it and hopefully uh, contributing to a, a final ultimate positive impact there. And as part of that, right, the, that, that both goes virtually and in person in terms of events, and also just other kind of asynchronous and more forum-based and long-tail-based discussion uh, and facilitation of knowledge. In terms of outputs, again, the research side, especially in terms of summaries and the research pulse and thinking of, you know, case studies and discussion posts and any grant programs that we've had that have contributed content to the forum, right, that was all kind of our starting point of, conver of uh, some kind of summary or a forum post that is generated based off of some research that already exists. And we tried our hand a little bit, this should be the bottom bullet of these three, but we also tried a little bit in actually supporting new research. There were a couple of projects that we granted uh, that where we were actually able to, to support that. And uh, one of the talent DAO uh, research projects that's happening is actually one of the last ones we were able to, to commit to uh, before the funding change kicked in. Um, 
And then on the other hand, you know, we've been thinking about some broader public good outputs, such as a smart contract audit database, also roughly since the inception or since the very early days, at least, of SCURF. Uh, and here, the whole idea is how can we create a single database uh, in a machine-readable uh, format that contains as many of the public audits as possible. Because right now, if you go uh, and look at the different uh, places where they're stored, they're in different formats, and uh, it's harder to use uh, to do research off of it. And pretty much people have to kind of build their own proprietary databases. So what if there was a single open shared database? Uh, or what if we generate the kind of open problems list, like the open problems in Dow Science document, or convert those to research roadmaps? Uh, or build uh, researcher directories of who's actually working on what in the space and who has produced what in the space to help us clarify, right, what should we be trying to curate and discuss? What knowledge should we be trying to facilitate and create a tighter links between the networks of, uh, you know, the people generating the actual research uh, and going through these exercises to help sense make across research. And then again, actually discussing it and, and going through these kinds of mechanisms we already talked about. The next bit is really focusing on network building. Uh, and here, you know, networks, uh, there are a lot of different types of networks that we want to tap. And for us, it's not a simple, oh, like pick one of these or, you know, just like a pick your own adventure here kind of thing. The, the, one of the challenges for SCURF is that for us to really accomplish our mission, we have to find how to appropriately interact with folks across all of these different types of networks and intentionally find the appropriate ways to bridge them. Right. If we tell everyone across all of these domains that, hey, all of you need to be interdisciplinarily focused all the time through SCURF, that's going to be overwhelming and not potentially what everyone's looking for. But if we can find the right balance that, hey, on our forum, we have certain types of content that is really meant for researchers and for, you know, active practitioners or some for experts or some that are more learning oriented. Right. We can keep kind of broadening the view of our content of the kind of interaction types that we have. Uh, and even right in the writing cohort, I know we're already, uh, Paul brought up the idea of how could we potentially use that as its own basis for mentorship and skill acquisition, right? What if there can be a 101, 201, 301, or things along those lines? And how can we create, right, from a, a user interaction perspective, a content type perspective, uh, from a community building perspective, how do we find the appropriate uh, landscape of problems and needs that people across these networks have? And then we intelligently fill those gaps and create new ones only where necessary. Otherwise, right, what we are doing should be feeding the existing networks and they should be coming to us. And whenever we see networks missing and people aren't collaborating or there's no incentive alignment, say, to create something like a smart contract audit database, then we can think of creating a new network to help create that kind of public good that everyone else can then benefit from and trying to think of those kind of feedback loops. Uh, and for anyone who's, uh, who, who's heard of the decentralized research uh, center presentations that I've mentioned in the past, in my mind, the decentralized research center framework or whatever you want to call it, uh, is a way to think about building out these networks, is understanding these networks within each single individual research domain. So to figure out, you know, who are all the relevant consensus networks and which new networks do you need? Um, so yeah, we can chat about that if anyone's interested, but I don't, I don't want to belabor it here. Uh, and the last point that I'll mention in the slide uh, before jumping into some of the, the potential user journey uh, is to talk about some of the components of primary research and what that could actually look like. Because if we, right, if we build on top of all of what we've mentioned, we're working with a lot of, you know, we have our great forum and community, we have the discussion layer on top of existing research, we're helping, we're helping to map open problems and who's doing what to be part of the discussions of new research as it's happening and becoming relevant. And as we get closer and closer to that, it kind of seems natural of, well, maybe we should get involved in research. Maybe we should explore filling the gaps of the projects that, again, maybe due to lack of incentive alignment or due to a problem being too big, no one is really choosing to work on it, but it might perfectly make sense for us as this kind of neutral organization that's just trying to create a public, a public good based benefits for the space. And right, if we start uh, hiring researchers, then we can think of all kinds of fellowship programs, whether it's, you know, difference uh, of full time versus part time or contribute in different formats or uh, link in with existing fellowship programs that are ready externally that are looking for interesting research collaborators. Um, and interestingly enough, we, we kind of had feedback from at least one of the potential funders we're talking to about how an interesting role that SCURF can also play over time 
is not just looking at and doing case studies, say we have the great post on our forum around source cred experimentation. And we can do that kind of Web3 tooling experimentation in the context of Scurf and write it up for the industry of like, hey, here's how a research environment using this one, a research support environment using this one. Um, but this could also be, say, for a new type of tool, say a hyper certificate, what if Scurf can actually act as a kind of program manager across a bunch of different groups trying to uh, execute those kinds of projects? And the reason it would make sense for us is because with the forum at the center of that, we can have a single place to continuously discuss, to give feedback, to bring these groups together to hear what's going on and think uh, and best think through where to go forward from there. So. These are just kind of some of the ideas uh, of from where we've started, where we've slowly been building towards, and, and what it's all kind of coming together as, uh, what that looks like uh, in, in my mind and how it can play together. Um, and I'll, I'll pause there for a moment, just I know I've been talking for a bit. Uh, so just to, at the very least, give your ears a rest for a little. Uh, but nonetheless, if you do have comments or questions at this point, would love to hear. And I do have two user journeys that I want to jump to, but I already see uh, some folks have their hands raised. So Lisa, I'll double check again. Do you, uh, do you want to jump in or uh, if not, we'll jump to Chris. All right, Chris, I think you can go ahead and jump in then. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for this presentation uh, once again. Um, what I posted is a link to a publication that I was a co-author on as an undergrad. Um, and what I, the reason I'm presenting that is it's very rare for an undergrad to get published. And I did not know that at the time. Um, but what I learned in the process is like publication opens up a ton of doors that money doesn't where, um, I had money at the time. It's not like I, my family was poor or anything. Um, what ended up happening was because I got published, I basically got a full ride for my first master's program um and in the process when i when i was in my master's program a lot of my colleagues or the the students in the program were like then referencing the work that had been published so they were like it was as close to like the doogie hauser situation as one could ever possibly be in real life um what the reason i'm saying this is as an academic or someone in industry in the sense of a reputation is something that has to be earned. It, when it's bought, it's not real. Uh, so if we're in a position where we can help academics start getting their work in a position to be published, um, it is better for them to be published in a uh, journal that already has integrity or uh, proof of a long history of not having spam articles rather than us starting a new journal to I, to publish in that if we can utilize like the open peer review process to accelerate the publishing process, it can actually take months or even years off of the process that currently exists. So there's a way to leverage the open peer review process which then would accelerate the publication process and if we're if we become a funnel to help people get published that then helps us identify problems identify areas in which problems can be researched identify the talent can that can then focus on it so that it's then balanced in its distribution and there's not uh an overemphasis on research in one area on accident because there's not an awareness of where research is happening um so there are many benefits to having this decentralized research center that not only network or maps the network but then targets areas for research to be uh uh analyzed by the specialists with the intention of helping those specialists get published in those areas in that a publication only happens when the information is relevant but also has been peer-reviewed to be valid within the context of that field so there it's not just the fact that it's done it's the fact that it's relevant to the field in which the research is being presented and also accurate 
So there are many things that it actually takes for a, a junior researcher to get published, and it's easier for them to get published alongside a senior researcher. And further, when a senior researcher wants to de dive deeper into a subject, it's much easier for them if they have junior researchers to do some of the legwork that, like, for example, I had to code all of the stimuli for that, that experiment. As a junior researcher on that project, I did all of the lowest work that was necessary for the highest work to happen, but it was necessary. It's not like anybody could do it. You, not everybody could just go in and code for an fMRI machine. So it's not like uh, because I was doing the lowest work, it wasn't important or complicated, but these are, there are situations in which a senior researcher would do better by having junior research assistants. And in the process, those junior research assistants would get publication credits. So this is where we have a potential to create a system where we're matching senior researchers with junior researchers to get people published while also giving people the assistance they need to do better research. Yeah, absolutely. And I know I was just chatting with uh, the folks uh, from MetaGov and the Dow Research Collective just before this, and we were talking about collaborating on the Dow, and sorry but for the, the, the acronym salad. We were talking about uh, the Dow Research Hub, which is the collaboration of the three of us jointly doing something together, which again is like the first trial of building one of these decentralized research center in, in the topic of governance. Um, but yeah, and, and thinking through the first uh, thing that we're probably going to target together as an activity uh, is going to be uh, providing fellowships for uh, students at universities and specifically getting that funded, considering uh, the Medigov community already found a few uh, potential funders who are interested in getting started with that. And part of that matching, I know, is, is very much what folks are excited about and why we also think like the, the separate thread of the research directory could be really powerful and helping just clarify who's doing what with some of these other approaches, creating this really rich environment to meet new collaborators, get feedback, uh, find new funders, and, and really find a, a lot of different ways to gain value. Uh, and I also just wanted to comment on, on two of the other specific things you mentioned with, with peer review. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think peer review is definitely, and thinking especially in the context of open and informal peer review, what are the things that we can start experimenting with, right? Because as of today, if you talk to, as Chris was mentioning, if you talk to an academic about peer review, they're thinking, oh, got it, it's a peer review journal. So we're talking about a specific journal, you know, run by ACM or IEEE or uh, Springer Nature or someone like that. And they have an editor who is finding a bunch of peer reviewers and et cetera, et cetera, right? They're not thinking necessarily of open peer review or alternative review structures, uh, right? Because review is, one topic of broader validation and verification because there's replication there's other elements when it comes to this broader topic that are not really captured by current peer review as it's done in the model so thinking about how do you more broadly verify and validate the research and constructively criticize it in an open way could absolutely be something we experiment with here and part of the logic of you know we, we've had to slow down our peer review project because of just the, the budget realities of recent times but the one thread we're keeping open there uh, is the open peer review community because we've connected with a, a dozen uh, i think it's at this point 13 different projects building different kind of web3 plus peer review initiatives and we want to make sure we're connected with all of them and we know what's going on that way as soon as someone's ready to trial something out where the, especially where the topic uh, of the papers themselves are uh, is the Web3 industry, that we're in a good position to potentially collaborate with them and, uh, and figure out how to best loop in our community into some kind of more open review trial as something like that uh, arises. So uh, I'm really excited about uh, that potential. Uh, and similarly on the publication side, uh, I mean, I know those of you who have met Renee here, uh, Talent Dow has been thinking about a future of work uh, decentralized publication, uh, and there are a variety of different groups thinking about, excuse me, more decentralized versions of, of uh, publications or micropubs, micro publications. Um, and then, you know, we are actually talking with a couple of DSI projects and uh, one of the, the kind of publishing old guard to potentially do like a contained couple of issue DAO 
that would be co-managed by like a dozen or so DSI projects? And what would it look like for instead of one group deciding who is the editor and entirely controlling that, what if you at least slightly open that up to a broader set of groups with a relevant domain expertise and at least take a step in that direction and it could be its own kind of contained experiment. Uh, nothing set in stone, which is why I, I'm kind of just vaguely alluding to it, but we just only had kind of a one potential conversation. So uh, more to come on something like that. But uh, yeah, John. Uh, there we go. Uh, just quick uh, suggestion for value add that SCURF provides um, the knowledge base that SCURF has of the space, of all the papers, uh, is a pretty big value add. If someone comes into the space and wants to find research related to the project, they can just ask us, and we're essentially the Ask Jeeves of crypto uh, at that point, uh, hopefully with a better outcome. Uh, so we can connect them to the appropriate projects and appropriate research. That's it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that yeah, and to be able to to do that and have that part of uh, our ability to have that offered, excuse me, as a value add uh, is predicated on, you know, having this great community and forum and engagement that we've already had, as well as some of these specific tools and mapping approaches that we're trying to combine. So these are all also very open ended questions. And it's been interesting kind of stepping a little more into the open science world, because that's definitely not my personal background. Uh, and realizing that these are not unique Web3 problems. These are just systems of knowledge problems. It's, it's just very hard to, you know, what does a bias for action mean? What is getting the right information to the right people? What's the right info? Who are the right people? What is all that? Like, how do you actually structure this and operationalize it uh, is not uh, overly clear cut. And a lot of it is just operating through ambiguity and just trying to create systems where great things can emerge. Uh, and I feel like Spurf has been on a fantastic path there and excited well, to to see that funders and outside folks are also excited about that approach. Yeah, one of the, the issues with the, this topic is it's just it's not easy to put into a Google search, like find research relevant to what I'm looking for. Not going to be uh, good outcomes there. But if you have this human based organization that where there's a bunch of people who understand all the assets on the forum, everything they've ever done, here are the past podcasts, here are the, the good research, here are the industries that have asked the same question or the, the projects that have asked the same question. That's a very valuable thing that I don't think that can be taken over by machine very, at least in the near future. Exactly, and that's why, especially from my own perspective, the importance of uh, focusing on, right, combining uh, the forum plus the networks, the human networks, and really taking that aspect of uh, not trying to like build the tool that gives everyone to, to, to come collaborate or do a thing, but much more focusing on the human side of it and the incentives and community and culture uh, makes a lot of sense. And just looking at the landscape, the competitive landscape, so to say, and I'm putting that in quotes, because if we're all helping research, then we're not technically competitors to a certain degree. We're all working towards the same goal, uh, at least ideologically. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, um, it, it's really, uh, yeah, just interesting to see how, how we can kind of uh, try to get the best outcomes going in, in such a not clear space. But uh, Chris, yeah, please jump in. Yeah, I, I actually want to reinforce what Jonathan was saying in that um, having worked in generative AI that wrote music, uh, one of the things in the field that effectively, it's not really, you can't necessarily come to consensus, but in over a decade, what they've been saying within the field of AI concerning what can be replaced in humans, um, the thing that is going to be the least replaceable is creative connections between ideas. Um, and that's really the one place that AI is not going to be able to keep up with humans in that connections are relevant to context. And the context is always going to be based on the human like concept. So quality is, a, is an ever moving metric, which is why AI has a problem consistently keeping the quality up, for example, in your playlist. If you don't thumbs up your playlist frequently enough, the quality of your playlist starts to drift relative to what you initially thought. And then this is the problem across AI, which is why a hybrid of automation and human input is consistently going to get a superior outcome than pure AI or pure human. And this is like across almost all industries where AI or machine learning is implemented. It's like machine learning can outperform humans 
to like an 85% efficiency rate in like almost all things, but it's that 15% creativity connection gap that is usually where the, the machine ends up failing. That to say, and th this point, is where Scurf, I think, should focus is like yeah. making those connections. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. And I think uh, a whole separate fun side thread uh, will uh, a future discussion can be about, uh, you know, with the with the kind of future we are hoping to enable and be part of uh, what role where do we potentially intersect with AI tooling in the future uh, is its own fun discussion point, especially when you start thinking about like research roadmaps and the directories and all the content on our forum. And, uh, but that's its own lovely rabbit hole that we'll save for another day. Um, but um, unless, and, and if anyone does have any any questions or anything, uh, please do feel free to raise your hand. Otherwise, uh, I'll, I'll quickly read or walk through uh, these kind of uh, two user journeys and then just a, li a little bit of thoughts on the uh, research perspective. But these are all meant to be kind of a future perspective. So uh, I'm going to look away from the shared screen. So I'm not going to see if anyone drops in chat. So please uh, do the virtual hand. So I hear the ding uh, and I know to stop and, and come back. Um, but basically, this is the perspective of a potential future funder, right? A single potential journey that a, a future funder can have. So uh, this future uh, funder, they work at an organization that has problems relevant to security, to cryptography, to governance. Uh, and they are dealing with these problems in the context of their project or protocol. And given the challenge around these, they're willing to, to spend money on it. And so they've been trying to figure out where to most effectively deploy capital to help make some advancements in those spaces. So they hear of SCURF, they decide to check out our various resources, our site, our forum, our community. Um, and then they happen to stumble upon the research roadmap uh, for, say, for cryptography. And then they share that with the relevant cryptographers on their team. Uh, they start looking through what are the most interesting nodes in this, uh, in this kind of discourse graph-based uh, layout of the cryptography problem landscape. Uh, and then by clicking through that, they're actually able to go through uh, and see the relevant research that's posted there. But that also uh, can interface with the directory, uh, the network directory that we're building. Uh, and so then they can actually see, well, who's actually produced research on that topic in the last year or so. Uh, and they start getting really excited about that. Uh, and decide to, to see what else Scurf might have to offer. And so they decide to uh, jump through the site again and realize that, hey, we're actually hosting a cryptography event at a major conference that they're going to in a month or so. And so they realize that they can just register for that and get a chance to meet a lot of the researchers that they're coming across. Uh, and then, uh, you know, following going to the event and actually connecting and finding some groups that uh, are relevant to the problems that they're specifically trying to tackle, you know, then uh, they start working with SCURF on actually uh, potentially funding more research on organizing a writing cohort around the outcomes of some of those most pressing problems, or to create more kind of discussion around some of those problems to help elucidate uh, some, uh, yeah, to just help kind of keep the, the, the positive momentum of research generating and problem awareness going. So that's kind of just one uh, funder potential uh, journey. On the researcher side, um, so this is a researcher who's been exploring topics relevant to Web3, uh, but from you know so, some topic that's relevant, say security, but not focused on Web3 exclusively, they decide to see uh, and better learn about what's going on in the space. They come across uh, the forum and the research pulse, and they start reading research that's relevant and in the general domain of what they've been doing, which is kind of per, uh, further piquing their interests. Uh, again, they see that there is a, a, a call going on uh, a community call discussing some of the relevant research uh, or a project in the space. And when they show up to that call, they actually hear that there's going to be a separate uh, convening just for security folks at, at a future point. Uh, and there they attend that session virtually and are able to connect with other researchers and funders there. Uh, and once they start talking to some potential funders about what their specific work could look like, uh, they actually start uh, going back to the forum to uh, look at who else has been writing, who has been engaging on the forum. Uh, they revisit the roadmap and they try to look for some potential collaborators and they talk on the forum and in the community to help them refine the specific research question they're exploring. Uh, and then as they actually kick off this project with the funders and some of the collaborators that they found through SCURP, uh, they use the forum for kind of continuous uh, and open review on their work as they're actually doing it. And they use the community call and chats to uh, workshop ideas 
uh, or extend some of that feedback into, into more of an in-person discussion. And so that's kind of a, a potential researcher interaction. Uh, and then this is less of a user journey, but more just some thoughts on how we might be able to interact with research in the future. Uh, but on this side, we could work with various groups to seed research teams uh, in SCURF uh, approaching open problems in a collaborative, open source oriented manner, especially on problems that uh, have kind of more open benefits and that no individual group is incentivized to deeply pursue. Uh, we could hire a mix of established and rising researchers and try to replicate uh, kind of some structure akin to, you know, advisors and PhDs, postdocs, and recognizing that we're not going to have like bachelor's and master's students uh or degree pursuing of any kind that's scurf itself right but how do we replicate certain elements here uh while also uh connecting with existing universities and the like um but yeah and then connect with new projects that are creating things like impact certificates and new uh, retroactive mechanisms that can actually get their uh, research more funding both in the short and long term uh, and uh, yeah, that, that's another opportunity, especially with all the infrastructure that we're building and have talked about uh, and building on top of the community and the forum that we've been uh, building from the beginning, uh, then we're in a really good place to kind of create these cycles of kind of uh, generating the research landscape uh, and being really a part of identifying what are the gaps that no one does want to fill. So um, I appreciate you all indulging me on just talking through those. Apologies, I haven't had a chance to turn that into anything more visual or engaging rather than just watching me talk for a bit. Um, but yeah, I, I would really love to hear feedback. And again, the, goal to, the ultimate goal of this is to kind of start a bigger discussion around what is resonating, what isn't resonating. Uh, and yeah, just kind of really having a wider discussion on our vision as a community. But yeah, John, please. This is great. Uh, it is very helpful from multiple perspectives, particularly like if I was a funder, I think this would be very uh, clarifying as to what SCURF's doing. Uh, and I understand it's from the perspective of just kind of throwing stuff out there and then scoping it in in the future as we discuss. But I, I, the, my one critical feedback would be it does seem to start getting very abstract. Uh, in the beginning of that first slides you were doing, it was very concrete. Here's what we do. Here's how we do it. Here's what you're walking away with when you walk away. Uh, towards the end, when you started talking about the uh, larger vision, like the long, long-term stuff, it gets more abstract as it should, because it's further, it's like that's years down the road. But I think there might be, need to be sort of a clarification that this is not something we're going to spend our next six months working on. Uh, so we have these values ready to give to you. Uh, and you know, in five years, you might have these additional things to give to you. Uh, but this was this was great. Yeah, thank you. I think especially because the goal of doing this is also this is aligning with some core ops exercises where we're kind of reviewing the projects that are underway and you know just taking feedback that both have came come in from the internal team and folks joining through various points is uh, we should really clarify our roadmap uh, and so it would be really helpful to uh, use this as kind of a potential vague you know longer term components but then really start. Uh, pulling in the, the near term elements and start building it out into a more focused roadmap, which then can clarify the funding and what's kind of, uh, you know, long term ambitions versus short to midterm actual action plans and things like that. Um, so, yeah, no, that that's uh, very fair. And I appreciate you pointing that out. Anyone else with uh, feedback? Oh, please. If no one else has feedback, I do have a question, but if, if I'd rather someone else ask something. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there, there are going to be different people interested in SCURF for various reasons. Like the abstract line of thought that was just presented is going to be interesting to one audience member, but not another. Um, so it's like all of the possibilities that SCURF could be um i think it is useful to identify like three hypothetical use cases and then identify like those for like what scurf could be with the demonstration of what has been done in the past whether it's active or not as like previous experiments to understand where scurf could uh exist in this space and i think that's where like 
um, any organization that intends to exist past its like current iteration has to make plans for the future with the understanding that those plans can change. So that's where it's like we we can't as an organization not have some sort of abstract future trajectories that we map out with the understanding that those are definitely going to change, but we can't uh, expect not to stagnate if we don't attempt to at least create some sort of abstract goals. And it's like they can't right. if sure. they can't always be concrete if if it's like you know something that we're trying to discover that we don't know exists, but we're searching for it. And I think that's where the experimentation comes in to allow organic things to be discovered. Yeah, so the, the way I would visualize that is, sorry, uh, you'd, so there's the, that abstract long-term goal that's more of a vision and that demonstrates, when you write that down, you clarify what you just clarified, you, you express that this is long-term abstract but what that does is it showcases sort of the grand vision of the project the people behind it what they're thinking about building the short-term products into in the future if they survive x number of years this is what we hope to go this is the direction we hope to go uh, but it, it's important to separate the two very clearly it's like this is what we're building now uh this is what we're building in the next year and it was, it's very likely this is what we'll build in next year. That's not going to change. You know, if those succeed, our next projects are, you know, super uh, lofty abstract goals. We're going to try and experiment in these directions and see which one brings the best value. And that helps both from a funding perspective and from a onboarding perspective. So if I'm a new user, I want to know exactly what I'm going to be doing for the next year. Like, do I am I going to be working to build something that isn't really clearly defined or are there a couple projects already going that need help now where I can contribute and then does my value set align with the greater vision of the people behind the project as well so I completely agree with you Chris and it's just uh, making a very clear distinction between what we're doing now what we're doing in the very near future and then what our vision is for like five years yeah for sure and that's where it's it's Right, and trying to come up with this and turn it into funding pitches and, you know, like other concrete things. Um, it's interesting how uh, the, the fuzziness or if you want to call it like the fuzz factor or whatever, right? But like, to your point, as you're going through that over time, it's increasing progressively. And once from an operational perspective, there's very much lack of clarity of like, oh, I don't actually know how to do that. That's a very great indicator of like, cool, that's a future term thing. And we got to focus on the near term things because if we can't visualize the path to actually getting something done, that's its own internal, uh, important internal barometer for now. Like, cool, well, that might be perfectly mission aligned in the fantasy world where we know how to execute that. But if we either don't have the resources or we're not ready to do something like all of the actual primary research stuff, right? Yeah, that, that would be so, that, that would be insanely disruptive to the org to try to jump into that now. Whereas, if we appropriately prioritize this and use just this kind of discussion, hopefully as the first of a few discussions in the next couple of weeks to really help us clarify that roadmap and present it in a more clear fashion of like, here's where we are and have been, here's what that's leading to in the next month through the end of the year, here's what we see as Q1, Q2 through the end of next year. And that can already start getting us much clearer to, well, which parts of these are like five plus years out versus, you know, once we clear a hurdle or something like that, because, yeah, there's a ton of moving parts here and I'm not going to uh, pretend to have like a, a detailed 20 year plan of what we do on a daily basis. That would be bananas and that would be a lie after like two months. Um, so yeah, that, that's one of those things, right? I very much believe too long-term planning is a fool's errand, but as important as you were both saying to have that like the, the inspiring thing of what the heck are we doing here in the first place? What is this heading towards? But then let's bring it back to like, how do we actually make it happen today, tomorrow into next year? I would love to continue coming back to these conversations in multiple weeks in a row. Uh, if Umar wants to go, go ahead. Uh, yeah, just really quickly, we, we will definitely come back to it multiple times, uh, both here and in the PPP and in some others. Yeah, sorry, Umar. That sounds great. Uh, I'd also, one question that I've had, one, I just want to say that um, I love the user journeys. That definitely also helps clarify for me. Um, what it looks like for people to come into Scurf and and find something that uh, gives them value. And I'm really looking forward to the visual version too, because I had a bit of a hard time sometimes keeping up. Uh, so 
uh, looking forward to just like more user journeys because that was great. And then one question I have is, is as I was listening to you was was just like how central to Scurf is the forum um, itself, like the actual posting on the forum. Uh, and, and this question is something that I've sort of had more after seeing sort of scurf.io and, and seeing that we're, we seem to be focusing more on chat than on forum. And I'm just curious, like, uh, what is the, yeah, what would just like how central to our strategy is the actual posting on the forum? You know, I appreciate you stressing that because I realize what's in my mind and what comes out can be, there, there's a dissonance there. So in my mind, the forum is the foundational glue that keeps all of these separate things together because it is very easy for like all of this vision stuff to be like a dozen smaller organizations doing very narrower things. So in my mind, the beauty of the forum and the fact that we can have the forum learning pathways towards engagement, this high quality engagement and moderation, this is the thing that creates a, a layer of kind of shifting knowledge facilitation across these domains, but contained within Web3 so that like we have this target moving target of get the right info to the right people to make positive change happen. That is never going to be fully clear of, you know, 100% clarity on what all of those variables mean. Um, but it's, it's, it's something interesting. Oh, is my audio coming through? All right, cool. Yep, can, yeah, it, it's yep. one of those, I'm just making sure it's one of those things that um, we do yeah, we, we, we need to just keep coming back to um, the, the focused work at hand while, yeah, sorry, so I really, that, that also threw me off and I realized I lost my thread. So I'm gonna come back to Chris. Umar, do you mind restating your question and chat again? And uh, I, I will leave off with any other thoughts I forgot while I'm rambling. I was gonna speak to his question because it was about the chat, the focus of the forum in that um, one of the reasons we need chat and we need a uh, synchronous discussion is that everything is not worth cementing in long-term history and that's where there needs to be the capacity to have these types of discussions where we brainstorm and whittle things out and then determine what is worth sharing and putting into the form long term and this is one of the things early on that i really pushed for video chats and the podcast and the live chat because there are things that happen in real time that you just can't capture in the forum because of the way that the forum communication occurs. But the forum is really good for in-depth, well thought out exchanges. And that's where chats are really good for the short term, uh, you know, let's brainstorm, whereas forum is good for capturing the well thought out response back and forth. Yeah, for sure. And on that yeah. side, I think there's a lot of room for right talking with other communities that might want to generate content or might want to play uh, other uh, other roles in that kind of environment uh, and not deal with the long term moderated discussion because it's very hard to run a forum well. So there, there might be a lot of groups that actually are excited to work with us in that kind of way. Uh, and yeah, please, John, pose your uh, your future call. Yeah, so it, when you started the presentation, one of the first things you said is uh, decentralized organization. Uh, and as we've been discussing here, we've acknowledged there's tons of moving parts within SCURF. So the question is really, uh, well, and tons of moving parts are not often handled well by decentralization. So the question is, if decentralized, why and how? Like, why are we? Why do we need to be a decentralized organization? And then if we say we're going to be one because of these reasons, how is that decentralization going to manifest? And I also do want to importantly qualify just to, to add to that, recognizing we're at time, but um, I was more implying the role of like the structural role on a global scale as opposed to the governance structure of whatever built that out gotcha. in the first place. Uh, but yeah, nonetheless, there's a lot of fun nuance to dig into there. And I have noted it uh, to add to the community call at some point but we are at time so thank you all for joining and have a wonderful rest of your thursday wherever you are in the world